sorry, you guys may go down likewise. And Psalm number 116. And I want to bring a message today having to deal a little bit with Thanksgiving. Likewise, as we had our Sunday school lesson. While you're turning there, in regards to Wednesday night's meeting, I know that people are busy with holiday fanfare, etc. But I think it is good for God's people to put the Lord first. Remember the Lord and you'll have a better Thanksgiving. You may say, well, Brother Burkholder, we've got company coming in. Hey, bring them on over to church with you. What if they won't come with me? Well, let me tell you about what I read concerning George Washington. It is said that whenever he was at Mount Vernon, he would be in his pew at church. Now, back in those days, people bought pews. In this day, people are more like squatters. They choose a pew out, and that's their pew. But back in the days of George Washington, they literally bought their pew in church. And it's said that whenever George Washington was at Mount Vernon, he would always be in church. And it is likewise said about George Washington that uh, if he had company at Mount Vernon, he would either bring them to church with him or tell them, I'm going to church, I'll see you when I get back. So, idea for you to follow. Now then, in regards to the Thanksgiving message this morning, and I will have more to say about that next week also, but I would first of all like to read this verse from Exodus 15 too. Many of you may remember it since it was one of our higher ground verses starting one of our church services. Oh, several months ago. In Exodus chapter number 15, I'm going to begin in verse number 1. Then sang Moses and the children of Israel this song unto the Lord, and spake, saying, I will sing unto the Lord, for he hath triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider hath he thrown into the sea. Now note verse number 2. The Lord is my strength and song, and he has become my salvation. He is my God, and I will prepare him an habitation. My Father's God, and I will exalt him. Then go with me over to Psalm chapter number 116. Verse number 12 of this psalm is the verse that I'm going to take my text from. I will read verse number 12 first, and then I want to go back and read the entire psalm. Verse number 12 of Psalm 116 states, What shall I render unto the Lord for all his benefits toward me? Now let's go back to verse number 1 and read the entire psalm. I love the Lord because he hath heard my voice and my supplications. Because he hath inclined his ear unto me, therefore will I call upon him as long as I live. The sorrows of death compass me, the pains of hell get hold upon me. I found trouble and sorrow. Then called I upon the name of the Lord. O Lord, I beseech thee to deliver my soul. Gracious is the Lord and righteous, yea, our God is merciful. The Lord preserveth the simple. Ma'am, we ought to have had a lot of amens on that one. I was brought low, and he helped me. Return unto thy rest, O my soul, for the Lord hath dealt bountifully with thee. For thou hast delivered my soul from death, mine eyes from tears, and my feet from falling. I will walk before the Lord in the land of the living. I believed, therefore have I spoken. I was greatly afflicted. I said in my haste, O men are liars. What shall I render unto the Lord for all his benefits toward me? I will take the cup of salvation and call upon the name of the Lord. 
I will pay my vows now unto the Lord, now in the presence of all his people. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. O Lord, truly I am thy servant. I am thy servant and the son of thine handmaid. Thou hast loosed my bonds. I will offer to thee the sacrifice of thanksgiving and will call upon the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows unto the Lord now in the presence of all his people. In the courts of the Lord's house, in the midst of thee, O Jerusalem, praise ye the Lord. Let us bow. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your wonderful word. We thank you for the hope that it gives us. We thank you for the encouragement it affords us. We thank you that the joy that it brings to our soul as we reflect and think upon our great and wonderful Lord Jesus Christ who died at the cross of Calvary for our sins and was gloriously raised again the third day for our justification. And I pray, O God Almighty, that thou mightest take these scriptures today and apply them to our hearts. For I know that only the Holy Spirit can take the word and apply it as each individual needs it applied to their individual life. And I pray, God, that you might speak to each one of us here today in a special way. And, oh God, again, I pray that that one or two or whatever it is that may be here and doth not genuinely know thee as Savior, oh God, I pray by thy Holy Spirit you might open their understanding. Grant them thy great faith this very day whereby they might come to see the truth concerning Jesus Christ, substitutionary death at Calvary for our sin, whereby they might see the truth of indeed the forgiveness is available because he shed his blood at Calvary, whereby, Lord God, they might come to see that indeed there is a heaven and there is a hell. And that the only way into heaven is through Jesus Christ as one's personal Savior. And then I pray, Lord, that you'll be with the people who are here and are saved. That they might have some special encouragement from thy word today. That we might indeed, Lord God, grow in grace and knowledge of thee. That we might indeed come into a closer fellowship and nearness to thee to be better servants and ambassadors for thy glorious cause. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Now, the text verse that I've read, What shall I render unto the Lord for all his benefits toward me? has often been a blessing to me and a thought-provoking verse as I have thought about the blessings of God and the need to render unto the Lord for all the wonderful things that He has done for us. I would divide this into three simple parts, if I may. I think that, for one thing, we might ought to try to enumerate some of the benefits of being a Christian. Notice I said some, because we'd be here forevermore till the Lord came, naming the benefits of belonging to Jesus Christ. But we'll try to get some of them in, and I recommend the Lord to you greatly. I think also that it is right for us to consider what is involved in rendering, which that may come as a little bit of a surprise to you when I get to that point. And then the third part is what activities would be involved in this rendering do the Lord's name. Now, first of all, I would like to say that basically this is for the child of God. Basically, this is for the one who is already saved. I know that the psalmist said, I will take the cup of salvation. When I get to that, I think you'll see what I mean when I'm saying that's not salvation in itself, but what goes along with salvation. I think this psalm is basically to be understood as being given out of the heart of one 
who already knows the Lord is their Savior. Now, I am aware this is the Old Testament. I am aware that Christ has not yet come into the world and died on the cross and rose again the third day and ascended back into the Father. But I'd like to say, folks, that to me, in any age, a person gets saved only one way, and that's through the work of Jesus Christ at Calvary. All of those Old Testament sacrifices but kind of rolled sin ahead until the one that should come who was promised, of whom Moses in the law and the prophets did write, came who was none other than Jesus of Nazareth, the Word made flesh, the incarnate God, as it were. I say the only way to get into heaven is through the shed blood of Jesus Christ our Lord. I say that's the only thing that really takes care of our sin. That is the only thing that really can be the forgiving pivot in this whole business, as it were. And so basically I'm talking here in this psalm from the viewpoint of a child of God. Now, of course, as we think about the child of God, he asks, what shall I render unto the Lord for all of his benefits toward me? I think I'd like to mention some of the benefits of the Lord toward us. It will not be exhaustive by any stretch of the imagination. The Lord is and has done and will do so much for us that we're not possibly going to even be able to understand it all, I don't think, until we do get to heaven and realize there in our immortal body, in our incorruptible status, the greatness of our God and Savior Jesus Christ. Until then, though, I think we ought to make an attempt or a good stab at trying to understand. And I think that we can see some of the benefits that we have of God here. And of course, at this point, I have to make mention of this. The greatest benefit that we can have here is salvation of the soul. You know, brothers and sisters, the Bible teaches there is a heaven and there is a hell. And the Bible teaches that we are all sinners. Some of us may not like to admit that, but not admitting it won't take care of your sin. The Bible teaches us that we must admit it and that we must also believe in the Savior, calling upon Him to be our Savior. You see, it's like this. Jesus Christ, the second person of the Trinity, God the Son, before the foundation of the world was ever laid, had a plan in mind of coming into the world and dying on the cross of Calvary, not for his own sin, for he had none, but for the sins of mankind, your sin and my sin. He took it upon himself at Calvary's cross. He alone was able to do that because he was the infinite God the Son, the infinite Son of God. The Bible says the wages of sin is death, and that's the sum total of death. That's the first death and the second death, which is eternal death in hell. But God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned. But he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. The greatest benefit there is, is to be transferred from the road to hell to the road to heaven. But of course, I've already said this is basically written for the Christian. Now frankly, quite frankly, the most of the Bible is written to the child of God. And as I mentioned Friday night at the Thanksgiving banquet, someone has calculated that there are over 7,000 promises in the Word of God to the believer, to the one who's saved. All the benefits of being saved. The hope that we have, 
the strength that we gain, the song that we sing. In fact, you may recall a moment ago I read from Exodus chapter number 15. And what did Moses have to say there in that song of deliverance? The Lord God is my strength and song. Now, in order to appreciate the strength that's to be found in Jesus Christ, you just about have to be brought to your wit's end. You just about have to be brought to the end of self. That can be the beginning of God in your life. And it is then that we can see the strength and consequently the song that God gives to us. What are his benefits? Well, even from Psalm chapter number 16, I can see many of them. For instance, in verse number 1, he says here, Because he hath heard my voice and my supplications, Jeremiah 33, 3, Call unto me, and I will answer thee, and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. Ephesians, now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or even think. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Wherefore, seeing we have a great high priest that has passed into the heavens, let us come boldly to the throne of grace that we might find mercy and grace to help in time of need. I am thankful that he has heard our voice and our supplications. Supplication is more than just praying. Supplication gets kind of into that vein of, Lord, I need this. Lord, if you don't do something, I'm going to go under. Have you ever been to that point? I mean, where you knew in your life that you needed God to do something for you? Has God ever done something for you? Boy, he has in my life. I'm grateful for his benefits. I go on into verse number 2. And it says in verse number 2, Because he hath inclined his ear. I like that business of inclining the ear. That's just not listening through the drone of all the ambient noise. But that is cupping, as it were, the ear to the child of God. That he might hear what his child has to say to him. Now his ear is good enough, he can hear it through all the ambient. But he uses that picture for our benefit. God loves you. Did I not turn my microphone on? Well, okay, let's start over. <laughs> God uses that picture of cupping his ear for us, for our benefit, to show us that he cares about our prayers. He cares about our supplications. He inclines his ear to us. He's got time for you. Sometimes Marshall will say something to me and I may not be able to hear her well. No, infrequently my mind will be on something else and I don't hear her. I better put it that way, hadn't I? I'm safer. You guys know what I'm talking to. Maybe you wanted something from your dad and you ask him about it and it finally got to the point where you as a kid had to pull on his coattail. Dad, dad, dad. And he's of course involved in something else. That's the way I was when I was a kid. He was usually talking to other preachers somewhere. Daddy, daddy, daddy. And I'd have to get his attention. But the Lord inclines his ear to our prayer. What are his benefits? Man, listen, you don't have to go through a priest. You don't have to go through Mary. You don't have to go through any organization. All you have to do is go to the Father on high through the shed blood of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. There's one mediator between God and man. There aren't a bunch of government bureaucracies between you and the top, brothers and sisters. You can go directly to the throne of grace by Jesus Christ, our Lord. If I don't hurry here, I'm not even going to get the benefits in. Or the few that I have listed anyway. Look at verse number 5. Here's one of them. Gracious is the Lord. Verse number 5b. God is merciful. 
Verse number 6, here's one of them. God preserveth the simple. I tell you, every one of us ought to rejoice at that. I know we like to think of ourselves as great students of whatever there may be around to be a student of. But after it's all said and done, you don't go very far in life before you come to find out that you don't know everything. You go a little bit further in life and you find out you don't know as much as the thought you knew. You go a little bit further and you find out you're wondering if you know much of anything. That's how it is. But God preserveth the simple. I want to put it this way. As I look back on my life, there are times that scare me now that I didn't even realize what was going on at the time. I am grateful that in my life God has been merciful in preserving me. When I speak about that, I don't know all the times God has kept me out of trouble that I could have easily gotten into. I don't know how many times God has kept me out of a wreck that I could have easily gotten into. I don't know how many times God has kept the robbers away from me. You see, a lot of times we don't even know and realize the benefits of belonging to God, the benefits that are afforded to us because of Jesus Christ, our Savior. And I go on down into verse number 6, uh, please. God preserveth the simple. He says, I was brought low and he helped me. You have to be a Christian and understand that experientially to appreciate it. The Lord is my helper. In Psalm that we've used as our higher ground. I'm reminded that verse number 6 says, This poor man cried, and the Lord heard him, and delivered him from all his troubles. I am thankful for the benefits that are in God. I could go on over to 1 Peter 1, 5, looking into the future, there, an inheritance in the heavens, reserved in heaven for you. And I could go to 2 Peter chapter number 1 and verses 1 through 5. Whereby are giving unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Or take, for instance, that according to his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness. Or this one, my God shall supply all your need. And as Brother Doug is wont to say in the adult class, many of our wants through his riches in glory according to Christ Jesus. I could cite Romans chapter number 8, verses 28 through 32. Now we know that all things work together for the good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. For whom he did foreknow, them he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called. And whom he called, them he also justified. And whom he justified, them he also glorified. What shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? Well, I'll tell you who is against us, and that's the devil. But greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. I could talk about the benefits in 37 and 38 of Romans chapter verse 8. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. I could cite John 14, 3. I go to prepare a place for you. In my Father's house are many mansions. Some versions of the Bible have, in my Father's house are many rooms. I heard tell there would never been a house built big enough for two families. 
get two families living together long enough, there will be a spat somewhere in the house. In my father's house are many mansions. I go to prepare a place for you. That where I am there ye may be also. I praise God for that. John 14, uh, pardon me, 10.10. 10. I am come that they might have life. I take that as eternal life. And that they might have it more abundantly. I take that as the life that we have here in Jesus Christ now. I'm glad I'm saved. I'm glad I can go to my Heavenly Father through Jesus Christ. I'm glad I have the promises of His Word. I could cite Ephesians 1, 3-14, and I want to go there, please. I'd like you to read this with me. In the New Testament book of Ephesians, please. In chapter number 1, and I'm starting the reading in verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath now, look at it, blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. And of course in Christ, he's a new creature. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. Verse number 4. According as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, and that we should be holy... There's positional holiness and practical holiness that you need to think of. But I like that part that we should be before him without blame. Without blame. Because I'll tell you what, every one of us are to blame for our sin. Oh, my wife made me do it. Or oh, my husband made me do it. Or oh, the devil made me do it. Did not, you did it yourself. I know we like to make excuses for ourselves, but we're the ones to blame. But in Christ we can stand before him without blame. When I get to the judgment seat on high and my name is called out, there's going to be another one answer for me. When you hear the thundering here, when David Burkholder's name is called out at the judgment seat, that's going to be the voice of Jesus Christ, God the Son, saying... I speak for him. Amen. You just keep quiet, son. I'll do the talking for you. Amen. In Christ. Now, without blame. Look at verse number 5. Having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us, look at it, accepted in the beloved. They say one of the big problems in the psychic world today is people get afraid they're not going to be accepted in this group or that group. I'll tell you where you better worry about being accepted and that's before the bar of God on high. We are accepted in the beloved and the beloved is Jesus Christ our Lord. Look at verse 7. In whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace, wherein he hath abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known unto us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure which he hath purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him, in whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will, that we should be to the praise of his glory, who first trusted in Christ that saved first in whom he also, ye also trusted after that ye heard the word of truth the gospel of your salvation in whom also after that ye believed ye were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise that's a good benefit I mean you don't have to keep yourself saved if you did you'd have lost it a long time ago but we're kept by the power of God one more benefit I'd like to talk about is from the book of Colossians. I've always loved this passage a great deal about Jesus Christ. In the Bible, book of Colossians, chapter number 1, verse number 17, 
The Bible says, and he is before all things, and look at that next phrase, and by him all things consist. Most literally, that phrase, by him all things consist, means by him everything is held together. If you're flying apart, try Jesus. He can hold your life together. That is what is going on right there. Now I could cite a lot of other things. I could cite Psalm 127. Verse number 1. I could cite Psalm 27, verse number 1. I could cite Psalm 103, verse number 10. I could cite Proverbs 22 and verse number 4. Psalm 118, verses 1 through 2. And I could go through the Bible talking about the benefits of the Lord. But I cannot exhaust it. And I can say this though that the unseen benefits are worth more than the seen benefits. Because the unseen benefits are eternal. The seen benefits are temporal. Why don't we be honest with ourselves? God has blessed us with many material things. I believe that. But they're going to pass away. But heaven remains forever. And he hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings. And so we have this question asked, God has given me many wonderful benefits. What should I render unto God for his wonderful benefits? And I want to look next at what we need to render just briefly, and then I want to go to the involvement of rendering. What shall I render? Well, Psalm 116, verse number 2, I will call on him. The best way I know to contrast that is many people are calling on the government today. The government needs to do this. The government needs to do that. Gimme, gimme, gimme. The child of God says, I will call upon him. What shall I render for all of his benefits to him? I'm going to call upon him. I'm, I'm, I'm going to my heavenly father through Jesus Christ. The next one that I think about comes down in verse number 13. I will take the cup of salvation. Now that has to do... Well, you may have heard messages before about what was in the cup. You know, when Jesus prayed, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me there in the garden. What was in the cup? It wasn't the actual cup he was talking about, but the circumstances surrounding it. The characteristics that went along with it. And I think that when the psalmist says, I will take the cup of salvation, he's saying, I will take whatever God brings my way. I will consider God in charge and if the cup of salvation means my having to sacrifice for the Lord, so be it. If the cup of salvation means that I have to give up some things in order to live for the Lord, I'll take the cup of salvation. And by the way, folks, I want to say this. You're never going to give up anything for the Lord but what it won't be restored to you a hundredfold. Now, you may not understand that till you get to heaven, but you will plainly understand it when you get to heaven was in the cup of salvation. Well, I can't say what exactly may be in it for you. I can't even say what exactly may be in it in a total sense for me, even though I'm on up in years there a little bit, and have been in the ministry scores of years, and have seen some good times, and I've seen some bad times, I've seen some lean times, and I've seen some fruitful times. I cannot say what may be in it down the road. But I know this, God knows, and God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able, but will with the temptation make a way to escape. And the psalmist says, hey listen, if the cup of salvation means the lion's den, then give me the lion's den. I'll put it this way. He's saying I'd rather be saved and go to heaven through the lion's den than be lost and go to hell for all eternity. I will take the cup of salvation. And then I think that it is good for us to look at verse number 14. 
of Psalm number 116. Uh, verse number 14 also has a counterpart in verses 18 and 19. Uh, you notice there he says, I will pay my vows unto the Lord now in the presence of all his people. I often think of that business, I will pay my vows. Oh, hey, wait, let me read verse 18 and 19 again. He again says in verse 18, I will pay my vows unto the Lord now in the presence of all his people in the courts of the Lord's house. I think of that business, I will pay my vows. You wouldn't believe the number of people promise the Lord what they're going to do when they're on the bed of affliction and when death is staring them in the face. And you wouldn't believe the number of people I've seen get out of the hospital and get well. I've seen God raise them up and that was the end of their vow. Well, God hasn't forgotten, let me tell you that. But this guy says, I will pay my vows now. Not after I've sowed my wild oats. Not after I've lived my life the way I want to live it and then come down to the end. Not when I'm older. Not when I'm ready. He says, I'll do it now. And he says, I'm going to do it in church. But pardon me, in the presence of his people? Eh? In the Lord's house? I'm a believer in the church of Jesus Christ. And I believe that people need to be involved in church. I believe it's one of the greatest ways that you can really serve the Lord and live for the Lord and show people out there who's first in your life. Our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I will pay my vows now in the presence. In verse number 16, he says, I'm going to serve the Lord. And that's where I want to go into the business of the involvement of benefits. I know I'm switching to the middle part right now, but I will switch to it and I will close out with this part. We have many benefits in Jesus Christ. Joy. My joy I give unto you. Love. He that knoweth not God loveth not. The love of God experientially. And charity in and through us. We have many wonderful benefits. As I've already said, the greatest of which is salvation in the Lord. And so he says, I'm going to serve the Lord. God has done so much for me. He says, I'm going to serve the Lord. He says it in this way, verse number 16. O oh Lord, truly, I am thy servant. I am thy servant and the son of thine handmaid. I believe that it is right for a person who is saved to count their blessings. Name them one by one. Or as they said up in Alaska, ton by ton. And I believe it is right for people who are saved to serve the Lord. Now when I come to that, I think of the word render. Render unto the Lord. That word render is a rather interesting word in the Greek language and in the English language. And in fact, it has a carryover meaning much the same thing with the different flavors in both Greek and in English. And so I'm going to take from Webster's Dictionary this about render to the Lord. But before I do, I want to say this, that I am fearful that a lot of Christians, and all I can do is go by what they tell me, I'm not the judge. I've got to leave that up to God. But I'm afraid a lot of Christians never get that far in their Christian life. To being concerned about rendering unto God what they can do for God. In the vein of God has done so much for me, what can I do for God? As I think about this, I think of that word render. And the word render has more involved to it than just doing something for God. 
the word render has more or less the idea of since God has given to me I owe him that is involved with the word render for instance in Webster's dictionary he has number one hand over he has number two give up or that is surrender we speak about I surrender all that's involved number three he has the idea of reciprocate as if I've gotten from God I'm going to give back to God number four he has the idea of give back but a little bit different flavor I got it from God in the first place I'm trying to return it to him it kind of like the talents business and the master leaving the ten five and two talents and hey then I should have received mine own with interest or usury if I may so say that's involved in that idea of give back or here's the fifth one pay what is owed now this is a little bit stronger word but it comes into my mind in this vein I think God does care whether or not we serve him and I believe he wants us to distinctly do for him pay what is owed do we owe the Lord are we indebted to the Lord I should hope to tell you we are if he has redeemed our soul from the hand of the enemy if we have believed the gospel of Jesus Christ dying on the cross for our sins rising again for our justification if we've had the forgiveness of sins if we've taken a good gulp of the living water taken a good bite of the bread of life we owe Jesus Christ and so this one is a little stronger pay what is owed here's another flavor though of that word render and it is represent how may I represent the Lord for all that he has done for me now do you catch the flavor of that of what others see us on the horizontal plane how may I represent the Lord now then we are ambassadors for Christ as though God to beseech you by us we pray you in Christ's stead be ye reconciled to God 2 Corinthians chapter number 5 and verse number 20 an ambassador represents his country that he's from where he's supposed to anyway we are to be representatives of Jesus Christ that they may see your good works and glorify your father which is in heaven what shall I render what shall I represent unto God and then the final one is deliver and this one has the strength of it deliver the goods in other words God has saved us to be his servants if you're saved and you're still alive on earth God has something for you that he wants you to do for him I believe that it is right for people to have the attitude what shall I render unto the Lord for all that he's done for me now I want to say this it is my estimation that there are people running around all over out there who name the name of Jesus Christ or who decry the way the country is going uh, kind of under a conservative Christian fashion so to speak and yet they themselves are not serving the Lord or living for the Lord they don't go to church they care not whether the work of God goes forward or backwards they're not as I said Friday night tithing witnessing or growing in grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior of Jesus Christ many people out there are even appalled at the way the country is going one of my favorites that comes to my mind is this business about prayer in school why don't why don't we put prayer back in school I see on Facebook all of these signs uh, how many of you are for putting prayer back in school
I have often thought to myself, man, the most of you don't even have prayer in your houses very much, let alone the school. You're not even studying the Word of God in your houses very much. And when Sunday comes around, you're more concerned about benefiting self than you are benefiting God Almighty. I thank God for you people who are here today. I thank God for those of you who care about rendering unto the Lord because what He's done for us. I think that's the attitude that we ought to have. But i got to tell you folks, I believe, uh, some of you are probably not going to appreciate this too much, But I believe our nation is under the curse of God because for so many decades this nation put other things first rather than God Almighty. You see, what we're seeing today is not the root of the problem. The root goes way back further. And people began to forsake the house of God. Pleasures took first place over God. When there was a ball game on Sunday, that took place over the house of God. You see, this goes back a long, long way, brothers and sisters. When people gloriously sang one nation under God and then forgot it. They weren't under God and neither was the nation under God. And now the, one of the big battle cries is, Oh, what we need is to put prayer back in school. Having a decree come out of Washington to put prayer back in the school is not going to do one bit of good. It's going to have to come out of the hearts of God's people. Not out of the halls of Washington, D.C. I believe with all of my heart that it's time for those who know the Lord as their Savior to come up with this thought, What shall I render? It might be easy to say to the people around you, boy, so-and-so needs to do better. Boy, so-and-so needs it. Did you see what so-and-so did? All were all PhDs in that kind of attitude. But I'm telling you, I think it's time for God's people to say, what shall I render? Forget about the next guy. What are you going to do for the Lord? You say, well, Brother Burkholder, I can't play an instrument. I don't sing because that's more of a benefit to people than me singing. I don't do this, I don't do that. Well, let me tell you this. You can go help keep the doors of the church open on Sunday and on Wednesday nights. Let me say this. You can get a Bible and you can have a portion read out of it every day in your own private devotionals. People want God in the schools, but they don't want Him in their homes. I want to say this, you can be a prayer warrior for the minister and for the people in the church who teach Sunday school and for those who go out witnessing. You say, there's not much I can do. Well, do what you can do. Well, one of the unfortunate problems is, is that with a lot of people, they've got so much pride that if they're not the chief cheese in the mousetrap, they're not going to be anything. It's so quiet in here, I can hear a pin drop almost. It's time for us to start asking ourselves, what shall I render? And don't just ask it, do something about it. Now I want to give you another idea here this morning. If you're here not saved, the first thing you need to render is your soul. It came from God. He breathed into Adam the breath of life. Your soul is eternal. Listen, brothers and sisters, the first thing you need to render is your soul. Without rendering it, you're not going to go to heaven. And one split second after you take your last breath here on earth, the only thing that's going to matter is where you spend eternity. So I invite you, if you're here today and not saved, meet me down here at the front or else take a place over here at the door to my right. We'll have someone come show you out of the Bible, out of the inquiry room, how to know for sure Jesus Christ is your Savior. If you're here and you are saved, there may be something in, in your heart that's telling you, I need to go to the altar. Hey, listen, maybe you need to come to the altar and ask the Lord, Lord, 
show me what you want me to re render. Lord, I know there are some simple things I can do for you, but what else can I do for you, Lord? Lord, thou hast done so much for me, I want to do more for you. I don't want to be a halfway Christian. I don't want to be in a halfway house for thee. I want to be in it with both feet for the Lord. May God bless you to know and do his will as we stand together with our heads bowed and eyes closed. Our Father in heaven, I thank you for your love and goodness. I pray, O oh God Almighty, that you might speak to our hearts now. I pray thee to have thy will and thy way in the individual. I pray thee to have thy will and thy way in my life. I pray, God, that each one of us might ask ourselves the question, what shall I render? Realizing that in all actuality, God Almighty, it's a privilege to be able to render unto Thee. O oh God, give us the attitude of wanting to do for Thee. Indeed, we can never outdo what Thou hast done for us. We can't even come close. I know that. But I pray, O oh God, that You might give this congregation the spirit of wanting, at least desiring, wanting to do for Thee. Now I know not the hearts of any men, thou knowest the hearts of all. And I commit all unto thee, Lord Jesus. I pray thee to have thy will and way on this invitation. In thy glorious name I ask it. Amen. Number 160 in the book, if you'd like to sing along on the invitation. If God has spoken to your heart.